So without transition, I, I start with the short uh, video, if it works. There is no sound. But Any comments? <laughs> what do you think about this uh, history of energy? Everybody knows Areva or not? Areva is the nuclear producer of uh, nuclear electricity, nuclear uh, plants in France. And France and beyond France. Do you think that I mean? Do you think that this history of energy is in any way faithful to what happened in the past? Uh, 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 pardon. Um, if that's the nuclear energy, we didn't really see nuclear energy first, and it seemed like it was really just a transition. We had one thing, and then only the other, and then only the other, and then exactly. only the other but it's actually much more of an additional thing that we've just added some nuclear power, uh, plants to the coal we had before, and then we added some solar to the gas we had before, and so on. Exactly. I mean, the, the history of energy presented here is a history of transition from one source of energy to another, from wind power to uh, hydraulic power to coal during the so-called Industrial Revolution in Britain, then to petroleum, oil, the US in the 50s, and lastly, uh, the last stage uh, of history uh, with non-CO2 uh, emission energy such as wind and nuclear energy at the very end. So it's a stage theory of the history of energy. Um, in a way, it is quite, um, I mean, it's, I, I wouldn't throw the stone uh, to, the, to, to Areva because they're just reflecting the common knowledge on the history of energy. And not only the common knowledge uh, or um, what's in the co general culture, but even they're, reflect I mean, they're reflecting what is being written by professional historians. Of course, they don't write it in such a, a, a simplistic way, but when you look at the historiography of energy, of energy history, you've got uh, transition everywhere. Um, the chapters and the organization of the books uh, on, on the history of energy are very often a stage theory. Uh, you've got, first of all, the organic economies, where the energy came from wood, water, wind. Then you've got the Industrial Revolution with coal, and uh, you've got the 20th century with oil. Uh, so you, you, in, in different ways, you've got the same kind of stage theory presented in various books. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you a full historiographical discussion right at the beginning, but during my talk, I will probably mention some of the books uh, of which you see the cover on this first slide. But of course, it is uh, in contradiction with what everybody knows in this room. I mean, we have never burned as much coal as nowadays. We've never burned as much oil as nowadays. And in a way, we have never burned as much wood as nowadays, since 2 billion people uh, across the world still use wood for their uh, energy, right? If you take the history of the material history of humanity, it is clearly a story of accumulation, not of transition. 
all materials are increasing. Um, this is on the upper left uh, graph. If you can see, I will just comment the upper left graph. You've got the material consumption of uh, the global economy from 1900 to 2000, to the year 2000, 2015 exactly. This is the, this curve. Even in the back of the room, you can see that this curve is just only increasing, right? Um, strikingly enough, you can't really see like the big historical events in this curve. I mean, you, you would need uh, a special magnifying glass to see the effect of the First World War, of the Second World War. Um, even the First World War with the Spanish flu, uh, uh, which, which follows the First World War, it just makes a very small dent in the always ascending curve, right? You can barely uh, notice the economic crisis of 1929. You can see a very small uh, hole or, 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 or slowing of the growth with the uh, 1970 uh, crisis, economic crisis with the oil shock. But the, the most striking thing is that this curve is always increasing at a faster and faster rate. After the so-called great acceleration of the 1950s, when there is a very strong economic growth uh, around the world, you have a new great acceleration uh, around the year 2000, mainly caused by the growth of China and South Asia in general. The other striking if, uh, fact is that uh, all materials are increasing. I mean, biomass, is increasing, mineral fuels, fossil fuels are increasing, and especially uh, non-metallic minerals, that is gravels, sands, concrete, in a way. I mean, which is really, the, in weight, the big transformation of the 20th century. It is the incredible consumption of concrete uh, for all sorts of infrastructure, and of course, this university is a very good example of that. Um, if you take, not this curve, but another statistics, you take the first 65 main raw materials uh, flowing in the global economy. Between 1950 and 2010, you just have five of which the, the consumption has decreased. Um, most of them, it's because there, there are um, uh, uh, prohibition, such as acetos, acetos, uh, of course, which is toxic, a toxic material. But otherwise, not even one material has ever become obsolete. Uh, I mean, that's, that's really, the, I think, perhaps one of the, the crucial points that you could remember is that in all the history of capitalism and innovation, despite the proliferation of new materials, plastics and so on and so forth, new metals, aluminum, you, you don't have any one raw material which has ever become obsolete, right? So, uh, the, 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 and, and that's just, energy is just one aspect of the general history of an increasing material consumption. Um, if you take the story of the uh, Industrial Revolution as a transition from hydraulic to coal, which you can, you can find uh, very, very often, a transition from water wheels to uh, steam engine, well, it's, it's very obviously, it's plainly wrong. I mean, for a very simple reason, it's that Hydraulic energy is increasing in the 19th century in most countries. In France, the amount of hydraulic power in the 19th century is multiplied by three. And that is even before hydraulic electricity. And of course, in the 20th century, with the, 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 the advent of hydraulic electricity, hydraulic energy just uh, skyrockets in every uh, rich country. If you take wind energy, of course, windmills, uh, uh, the traditional windmills disappear, but uh, wind power is everywhere. It is completely dominant for navigation, for the uh, transportation of goods, not necessarily of, of, of people, but of goods. It is absolutely dominant all through the 19th century. And it is a very important source of energy for agricultural reason. Uh, in the Great Plains of the Midwest in the US, you got six million windmills 
in the late 19th century, powering as many pumps. And those windmills had the tremendous uh, historical role of making possible uh, the agriculture in the, in the Midwest. That means that, I mean, the, the opening of the Great Plains of the Midwest is clearly uh, a major historical phenomenon. I mean, it is after the 1860s, 18, late 1860s, that the fear of, of scarcity, of famine, of a lack of grain in the rich country, uh, in the rich countries of Europe, disappeared f forever, in a way, until now. Uh, and it is in part thanks, of course, to uh, the improvement in agriculture, to the improvement of the transportation network, but it is also thanks to the um, flow of grains coming from the Midwest or from Russia. Right? So, I mean, my point would be here that you've got extremely important historical <coughs> phenomena uh, which are not coal powered, which are not relying on coal. And, I mean, what we are talking here about uh, here is probably just as important as the advent of steam power and the manufacture of textile in Britain in the early 19th century. Okay? And this is an historical phenomenon which depends mainly uh, upon winds. But if you take human muscle, I mean, the human muscle is not replaced by machines, obviously. Uh, human muscle is used more and more with more efficient technologies at the end of the 19th century. Human muscle, first of all, of course, is uh, behind all sorts of coal technologies, uh, the extraction of coal, the construction of canals, the construction of railways, uh, earth-moving equipment, bulldozers do not exist until the 1920s in the US and after 1945 in Europe. So before 1945, all sorts of infrastructure have been built with human muscles, with shovels, spades, wheelbarrows, okay? So uh, the new world of the, of the 19th and even of the early 20th century is strictly dependent on an input of, uh, of human energy. And at the end of the 19th century, you've got a proliferation of new technologies which um, increased the, um, the importance of the human muscle. There are not very famous technologies uh, like ball bearing, for instance, all sorts of technologies which decrease the friction, the, which makes human power much more efficient. All sorts of carts of, uh, for instance, a very flat cemented floor, you know, and a rubber wheel that completely transformed the way you can handle goods in, 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 in a factory. Okay? It's not necessarily based on, on uh, coal or, or oil. So this is, I mean, this should be completely obvious. A less obvious point is the fact that energy do not uh, actually enter in competition. In most cases, energy have symbiotic relationship. Uh, they're not necessarily in competition for a specific market, but they very often uh, help themselves rather than exclude themselves. I will come back once again on the way history of energy is uh, treated by historians. This is a very important graph. Uh, this is a graph which uh, has been published by uh, Anthony Wrigley, a major historian of the Industrial Revolution uh, in Britain. Uh, the data uh, has been produced by Paul Ward, an important historian of food uh, in, in Britain um, and Germany. And this graph has been then taken up by all sorts of books, which I mentioned in my first slides, in Richard Rhodes, in Vaclav Smil, uh, in Power to the People books, of course, in Wrigley's book. Uh, you got, uh, uh, they are building up on this graph to depict the Industrial Revolution as a transition from wood to coal. Because on this graph, you can see uh, a huge increase in, the, in coal, which is the light gray area, this area. This is coal. This is, sorry, this is the 16th century from, for people in the, in the back of the room. This is the 16th century. This is mid-19th century. This is Britain. This is Italy. Italy in 1860. Um, so here you've got coal, which is increasing uh, very fast uh, 
uh, in, the, in the late 18th and 19th century Britain. And here in the dark gray, you've got wood, which, which, uh, uh, which dis disappears, completely disappears in mid 19th century Britain, or supposedly, as an energy source. Okay? But this graph is just one way of representing the history of energy and of calculating uh, the, 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 the energy input. I just want you to consider for one, one moment uh, coal mines. Coal mines in Britain, early 20th century, are comprising thousands of miles of galleries. I mean, they are really a huge, huge thing, okay? Not just in Britain, in every major industrial country. Uh, we are talking about 1,000 miles of galleries, of subterranean galleries. Uh, these galleries are warm. They are also very wet. Uh, they also have a very strong tendency uh, of collapsing. And the collapse of the roofs of galleries is the main cause of death among miners, among coal miners in the 19th and 20th centuries. And it means that you've got to uh, put wood, huge quantities of wood, to sustain the roof of galleries, of the, of the mines, of the coal mines. Um, you've got to change the, uh, the, the pit props every three or four years, every three or four years. Um, in total, the coal mines of Britain of the early 20th century use 4.5 million tons of food every year in the beginning of the 20th century. 4.5 million tons, it sounds quite a lot and it's very abstract. Just to give you a point of comparison, uh, Britain burnt 3.5 million tons of food in the mid 18th century. Which means that just for coal, Britain is using more wood than it was using in the 18th century. Okay, so this idea of a transition, of an energy transition from wood to coal, of course, is uh, very debatable. But the case of Britain is just one particular case. I mean, it's not, the, 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 this consumption of food is not exceptional. Um, this is a, a series of graphs uh, of, 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 uh, which, which are representing the amount of food consumed by coal mines in different countries, on different continents. Uh, I don't know if you can see, uh, I mean, this is Russia, Russian coal mines. In the 1960s, Russian coal mines are using 25 million tons of food every year. 25 million tons of food, it's more than what all the French forests are producing uh, in, the, in the 19th century, far more, yeah? Sorry, the, the, the it was USSR at that time, so I mean, like to understand, it's also not the, the territory of Russia. Yeah, it's right? USSR. You're right. Yeah. It's actually the, of course, the legend say USSR, URSS. Indeed. Um, so I mean, the, the, my, my point would be that this graph shows how long it takes for a new energy source to become autonomous from ancient material, older materials and older energies, and it takes a lot, lot of time. Okay. It is only in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, that you got uh, new ways of extracting coal. And you can see that these new ways of extracting coal with machines, different so sorts of machines, uh, really have an impact on the consumption of food by coal mines. Okay? Um, but otherwise, despite all sorts of efforts to economize uh, to spare wood in coal mines, well, that doesn't work. The coal mines are just consuming a constant amount of wood for every ton which, are, which, uh, which is dug out of, uh, of coal mines. But coal mines is just one example. Uh, all sorts of technological systems which are uh, seen as symbolic of coal is actually depending just as much as uh, uh, on wood. If you take uh, railroads, they are consuming a huge amount of wood for railway ties, of course, for all sorts of infrastructure. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, in, in the US, there is really a, a kind of scare about the exhaustion of forests 
of forests caused by railways. Engineers uh, made calculations that um, the US rail railroad network consumed like 10% of all forest, all forest products, all the, all the wood uh, of the US in the beginning of the, of the 20th century. So, I mean, it is no surprise that uh, all the major industrial countries, uh, they increase their consumption of wood with the Industrial Revolution. Okay? If you take uh, the case of Britain, the, uh, the consumption of wood is multiplied by six in total, and it is multiplied by three on per capita terms. Okay? This symbiotic relationship between wood and coal is also uh, present for, uh, for, for oil and wood. Uh, the extraction of oil for a very long time depended on wood as well. Derricks are built with wood until the 1950s, and they, have massi they are massive structures. Uh, they take, take up like 30 tons of wood for one derrick, and in the US, mid-1940s, you got uh, half a million derricks uh, in activity. But oil for a very long time was transported in part uh, by barrels, wooden barrels. Um, you've got the, uh, in front of you the uh, biggest wooden barrel factory in the world, and it was um, set up by Standard Oil, by Rockefeller. Rockefeller was also the biggest a barrel manufacturer in the world in the early 20th century. Another major um, historical phenomenon that you can understand as a symbiosis between wood and oil and petroleum is suburbanization. The extension of suburbs uh, in the US, but not only in the US, actually, uh, all across the world. Um, suburbs depend on oil, of course, because you need cars. They depend on uh, concrete, cement, so coal in a way, uh, and they also depend on uh, wood. Uh, in the 1950s, 90% 90 of the new, uh, how, of the new, uh, I mean, 90% of uh, buildings are individual houses in the US, okay, in the 1950s. So uh, individual house is clearly dominating the construction uh, market. And 80% 80 per, 80 of uh, those houses are built of, are built, uh, of wood, okay? Um, and you got new kinds of wood. Uh, you got plywood, which is more and more used for housing, or particle boards, uh, which is a mixture of wood and um, new kind of material derived from oil, or from petroleum, uh, formaldehyde, uh, new kind of resins, plastic resins, which allow the production of plywood and, and particle board. All sorts of insulation materials are also depending on this kind of plastic foams, uh, poly poly polystyrene, po polyurethanes, uh, which is invented by Otto Bayer, in, this is Otto Bayer, a German chemist in 1937, which completely transformed um, the way you build a house. The, 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 the great uh, increase in the productivity of the construction sector, they're really based on these new materials, new building materials. Wooden panels, they just, uh, uh, they are so much more efficient than planks, okay? I mean, you, you can build much faster house in the 1950s than in 1930s, thanks to these new materials, which are a, mixed, a mixture of oil and wood. Another crucial sector where oil and wood are, uh, are entering in interesting symbiosis is, of course, the logistic, uh, the transportation of goods. They depend on oil because your trucks is, of course, dominating the transportation of uh, goods, not raw materials, but uh, industrial uh, I mean, uh, uh, goods in general. Um, and then you need uh, wood, which is really the, the crucial material for uh, packaging. Uh, from pallets to uh, cardboard. This is really the dominant packaging material. Uh, it is far more important than plastic, for instance, as a packaging material. 
And the, the, I will just give you an example of uh, non-transition. I mean, on the lower right corner, we've got a picture of Drax power plants. I don't know if you've heard of Drax power plants. This is a, uh, a power plant in Britain, close to near, near Leeds. It used to be a coal uh, power plant, and it has been uh, transformed to a biomass power plant, which means actually wood chips. And Drax uh, import the wood chips from the US, from Canada. They at, at Drax, um, uh, Drax uh, plant burns 6 million tons of food per year. 6 million tons, it is more than the pit props and timber mining that I mentioned in the, in the previously, and it is almost the double of what Britain did burn in the 18th century. So you see that after two centuries of energy transitions, you arrive at the result that Britain is using much more wood for its energy than it did in the 18th century. And of course, I mean, the, the strange thing is that petroleum increased the amount of wood, the wood resource. Because you've got new engines, uh, the chainsaw, uh, new forestry roads, uh, all sorts of uh, innovation which makes forestry much more efficient, much more productive. And also, for instance, oil uh, allows you to produce um, uh, synthetic textiles, nylon, which reduced uh, the importance of, uh, of sheep for wool. And so you can grow more forests. In, in general, when agriculture is more intensive, you've got an in, I mean, you can grow more forests and have more wood. So in many ways, uh, many different ways, oil and wood are not exclusive. And on the contrary, they are, uh, uh, they are, uh, they are having a symbiotic relationship. But of course, this symbiotic relationship between wood and oil uh, exists for coal uh, and oil. I mean, sometimes you can find in the historiography that uh, oil replaced coal, but it's clearly wrong. I mean, oil really uh, fuel a new kind of technical network, which is the car, the automobile. And this new technical network uh, creates new demand for coal. To produce a car in the 1930s, you would need seven tons of coal, which is just as much as uh, in terms of weight of the oil that this car would burn uh, in its entire life. Okay? So if you look at, a, at an automobile, it's just as much coal as oil. I mean, engineers are doing calculations in 1930, and they're explaining that for each ton of oil, you need 2.5 tons of coal to produce the network, uh, the, the automobile, the pipeline, the tankers, the reservoirs, and so on and so forth, which make this uh, oil, oil system possible. So, I mean, the, the next part of my talk is really about answering this question. How come that despite this obvious fact that the history of energy is certainly not a history of transition, how come that transition has become the dominant narrative, not only in historiography but in the general culture? First of all, uh, I have to say that it is fairly recent. Uh, until the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, transition was clearly not the dominant uh, analytical framework when people, experts, were thinking uh, about energy. Since the 1920s, late 1920s, you, you have these sort of uh, graphs which are produced by experts, economists, engineers, foresters, geologists, petroleum geologists. And when, uh, when, this, uh, when they see this graph, they don't see any kind of transition. They see just an accumulation. And if coal is decreasing in after 1929, it is, of course, not because it is becoming obsolete. It's because there is the economic crisis. And also, since the uh, 1920s, you've got a very strong uh, effort for energy efficiency in uh, power plants in the US and in, and in the world. Uh, coal is becoming more, exp more and more expensive during the, the First World War, and there is a shift from um, steam engine to steam turbine, and they have a very different kind of efficiency. So the reduction of uh, the consumption of coal is never understood as a transition. On the contrary, I mean, electricity uh, 
because it is more efficient than steam engine, uh, of course, allow, uh, allows the uh, decreasing of the consumption of coal, but it is making coal even more central to uh, economic growth because electricity is depending on, on coal. Another kind of graph, um, 1974, I mean, they are using a logarithmic scale to show the fact that wood remains very important as an energy source in the US. Okay? Uh, it is less important than in the 1900s, but it's, it remains at a very high level. Another uh, kind of, of graph, I think these graphs are very important for understanding how history of energy was understood. I mean, they're really uh, important intellectual tools for uh, experts and historians to, to, to tell about, uh, to tell a history of energy. Um, this is a, um, a study in futurology. It's a, a, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the person who is writing this, um, the article is a promoter of solar energy and is uh, forecasting energy, the energy mix of the United States in 2200. It's a 1972 article. I mean, the interesting thing in this graph is that every energy source is going to increase. There is no substitution between sources of energy. Uh, coal is going to increase. Uh, solar energy, of course, is going to increase. He's a promoter of solar energy, but also nuclear power is going to increase. Uh, oil is going to increase, even if it's a different kind of oil. But for, uh, for the author of, of this graph, I mean, the future is just seen as a bigger present, not as a very different present, okay? Everything is going to be uh, consume bigger quantity, but it's not going to be a very different technical world, if you wish. So where does this idea of energy transition uh, comes from? At the beginning, you've got a very strange, uh, uh, very peculiar kind of scientists. They are both atomic scientists and Malthusians. Most of them have worked uh, for the Manhattan Project, for the, of course, uh, the, the construction of the first uh, atomic bomb. And more specifically, they worked at the Metallurgical Laboratory in Chicago, where they devised the first atomic pile. They are extremely impressed by uh, the equation of the nuclear reaction, and especially of uh, what is called the fast breeder reactor, surgénération in French, uh, where in this kind of reaction, which has never been actually uh, really uh, uh, implemented for the moment, in this kind of atomic reaction, you've got, uh, I mean, most of the energy contained in the uranium uh, element is used. And they are obsessed with, with this idea that to solve all sorts of problems, of the lack of natural resources, of demographic growth, you need nuclear energy. And that the fast breeder reactor is really the key for the future. If you take, I mean, one of the character in this, um, of the main character in this respect is Alvin Weinberg, who will become a very important uh, uh, nuclear expert in the US in the 1960s. And in his autobiography, he's really writing that he became obsessed with this idea of the fast breeder reactor as uh, a crucial element if humanity uh, wants to have any sort of future. When I'm saying that, when I, when I say that they are um, Malthusians, because they are obsessed with, with the problem of demographic growth. I mean, it is perhaps something that we have forgotten, but for a very long time, of course, uh, population growth was seen as the major environmental threat, okay? And uh, all sorts of people that we are now considering environmentalists, they were actually neo-Malthusians. And this question of uh, population growth was absolutely central, especially in the US and in Britain in the 50s and 60s. Um, why there is a connection between population growth and atomic energy? Well, it is because if you've got an unlimited and extremely cheap source of energy, you can do all sorts of things to solve the problem of uh, population growth. For instance, you can create this kind of uh, atomic uh, 
agricultural conglomerate, agro-industrial complex, uh, where an atomic plant is uh, desalinizing uh, the, the water of the oceans to irrigate large arid lands. They can create, um, um, sorry, they can create fertilizers, and so you, 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 you can increase the carrying capacity of the earth with this atomic uh, abundance of energy. The scientists who invent, who coins this, this, the expression energy transition is Harrison Brown. Harrison Brown is a chemist. He worked at the metallurgical labora laboratory uh, during the Manhattan Project. Uh, he's a specialist of uranium, plutonium. He's also an important uh, neo Malthusian. He, 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 he's participating to all sorts of uh, neo Malthusian leagues and, 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 uh, and associations in the US in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and the first time he writes uh, energy transition, it is in a paper uh, which is part of a, a larger conference on population control, on the control of uh, the population growth. And what he says is that um, just as in the uh, 19th century, coal has increased the carrying capacity of the earth and has allowed the demographic expansion of the 19th century, in the 20th and 21st century, nuclear energy is going to completely transform the parameter of the demographic problem. Um, and interestingly enough, this phrase, energy transition, uh, Originally, it came from atomic physics. An energy transition is when an electron is doing something uh, different uh, around its nucleus, right? So it is quite easy to see that this uh, culture of nuclear <coughs> utopia, of a future powered with nuclear energy, is, is really what is behind this idea of energy transition. Another key intellectual uh, for, for, this, for the theory of energy transition is Mayan King Herbert. You might have heard of him, uh, or you might have heard of his theory about peak oil. Peak oil is, of course, a, a, a famous uh, phrase, a famous expression. Uh, the idea that the uh, reserves of oil are very limited and that we are going to reach soon enough uh, a peak in oil production and therefore consumption. Okay? My young King Herbert is really the big promoter of this idea. He's an important geologist working at the Shell Company. But um, what is less known is that he was a very important expert for the Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission is founded in 1947 uh, by the American government. Its first purpose is the production of the H-bomb, but then very, at the same time actually, uh, they uh, fostered the idea of a civilian program of atomic energy. And as soon as, as early as 1947, they are putting quite significant amount of money in the building of nuclear reactors. But of course you need to justify the fact that public money is going to be spent on a technology which I mean, for all, for most economists, nuclear energy was non, not, not, I mean, it was not interesting in economic terms for plenty of different reasons. It is very, well, I mean, in 1947, it is just, uh, it's not existing yet. Uh, and for, for the production of electricity, the main part of the cost of producing electricity comes from distribution. It is the distribution of electricity which is expensive. Two thirds of the cost of electricity, I mean, till nowadays, I mean, is linked to the distribution of electricity, not the production. So, so even if you've got a slightly more efficient fuel uh, than coal, it's not going to change radically the economic equation. So you've got all, many reports on the, on the, by, by famous economists, uh, future Nobel Prizes, who explain that atomic energy for civilian use is completely useless. It is not uh, interesting in economic terms. It might be useful to power a submarine or to destroy your enemy, but it is not useful for producing electricity. And atomic scientists and the, I mean, are very upset, but they, what they, I mean, in their opinion, they, for them, the economists don't, they, they are missing the point. 
The point is not to show that uh, atomic energy is competitive, is to be sure that you will have a, a, atomic energy when coal will have disappeared. So it's really an argument for the future, about the future, about a future where coal and oil, of course, will have disappeared and where atomic energy will become absolutely indispensable. And Mayun King Hubbard is the key intellectual for making this point. All the papers he, he writes after uh, 19, in, the, in the 1950s about the peak oil, they are linked to the promotion of nuclear energy. And the very idea of peak oil, I don't know if you can see the graph, is linked to, this, uh, to, to the problem of nuclear energy. I mean, this is the all fossil fuel. This is the history of humanity from, I mean, zoomed out uh, on the 10,000 year scale. And if you zoom out sufficiently, you can see that all fossil fuels will just be this very small and narrow event in the history of humanity, because they are very limited in quantity. And on the contrary, nuclear energy, if you do uh, the fast breeder reactor, is opening a kind of endless plateau of energy abundance. So this idea of peak oil is really uh, is appearing just because you compare fossil fuels with nuclear energy. There is one crucial topic which explains the diffusion of the idea of energy transition in the US and in the world. It is the idea of energy crisis. This idea of energy crisis, most of the time, it is related to the uh, oil shock of 1973. But actually, when you look in detail, um, you see that the idea of energy crisis is appearing a bit earlier in the nuclear uh, propaganda, and especially in the document of the Atomic Energy Commission. <coughs> and it's not about oil, it is about electricity. In the late 1960s, you got a series of blackouts in the US, and especially a famous one in New York in 1965. Obviously, it's not because the US is lacking coal. I mean, there's plenty of coal in the US. There are plenty of good reasons that make coal uh, scarce for, uh, for power plants in the US. And the main reason is that uh, US coal mines prefer to export coal for, to, to Japan and, and Europe for uh, producing steel rather than uh, selling their coal to the US power plants. But in the nuclear, um, nuclear discourse, this series of blackouts is not, uh, I mean, the sign of some, something much deeper. It is a sign of an energy crisis. The other point of context is that uh, in the late 1960s, you've got uh, a series of uh, legal fights between environmentalists and uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, fights about the authorization of nuclear plants. And nuclear plants are delayed and delayed by all uh, these, uh, these debates and this uh, contestation against nuclear plants. And the Atomic Energy Commission is explaining to the public that, well, uh, the environmentalists, you know, they are nice, but uh, they are... Uh, creating the condition for an energy crisis. So at the beginning, this idea of energy crisis is a countermeasure for the idea of environmental crisis. I mean, it is very clear. In, the, in, 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 in a speech by one of the, uh, of the director of the Atomic Energy Commission, there is really this uh, comparison. I mean, the environmental crisis is everywhere in the press, on the TV, uh, you, you, you got a, 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 on, in the news, they are talking about sp oil spills and all sorts of uh, terrible things. But the real crisis, it is the energy crisis. And it is coming very fast compared to the environmental crisis, which is, you know, kind of slow disaster. It's not an immediate threat for the, for the US. And for example, this uh, advertisement by General for General Electric is about the uh, uh, the nuclear breeder reactor, and they are explaining that coal is going to become extinct. Okay. So quite early on, you've got this idea of an energy crisis, and energy transition is the solution against this energy crisis. But till 1973, uh, this discourse about energy crisis and energy transition is kind of marginal. It, 
just it is confined to the uh, to the nuclear uh, nuclear the promoter of nuclear energy. The big transformation after the old shock of 1973 is that this vocabulary of energy crisis and energy transition became everybody's vocabulary. Uh, everyone now is talking about energy crisis on the TV, uh, in the press, and everyone is talking about energy transition, even environmentalists. And it is probably a sad thing, actually. Because after 1973, the environmentalists just take for granted that you can have an energy transition. You know, in the past, there have been tr energy transition. We can do an energy transition very easily. I would just take one example is Amory Lovins. Amory Lovins is a member of Friend of the Earth. He's a young physicist. Uh, he is a, I mean, very famous for a 1976 article on soft energy paths. He, it's an article in, the, in Foreign Affairs. It creates a huge stir in the US. Uh, you've got uh, several books uh, which are written against or in favor of, uh, of his theory of soft energy paths. I mean, what, what are soft energy paths? Basically, it's solar energy. And in, uh, in Lovin's article, you got inc an incredible confidence on the fact that, yes, you can have a complete shift from a fossil fuel-based economy to a solar-based economy in just 20, 30, or 40 years at maximum. Right? So the strange thing is that uh, the environmentalists just take the same kind of uh, vision of what is the material world as the nuclear physicists as the atomic malfusion that I mentioned before. Okay. But energy transition became really common currency after a famous speech by Jimmy Carter, 18th of April, 1977. <coughs> you can see this speech, you can find this speech on YouTube. Uh, Jimmy Carter, president, of course, of the, of the US, uh, it's a, it's a speech in front of the, for, for the television. He, he starts his discourse with a kind of history of energy. In the past, the US uh, has known two transition, energy transition, one from wood to coal, the second from coal to oil, and now we have to enter to create a third transition. And after this speech, um, this idea of energy transition is, becomes global. The UNO uh, set up a conference on energy transition in Nairobi in 1981, where in 1981 you, you see many different countries explaining that we are going to go out, we're going to exit oil uh, in the next decades, and of course nothing happened. Right? The, the speech, this speech, this idea of uh, transition from, from fuel wood to coal and then to uh, oil is based on this graph. It's a graph taken up from the uh, National Energy Plan, a document, a report that uh, Jimmy Carter had uh, ordered a few months earlier, where you find this graph. And this graph is extremely strange. I mean, it is completely different from all sorts of graphs that you find at that time, which is like, this is the standard way of representing the evolution of energy where well, you don't see any kind of transition, right? When you look here, yes, you see uh, two beautiful transitions, OK? So where did this, ga this graph uh, came from? It comes from um, an Italian physicist called Cesare Malchetti. Cesare Malchetti uh, is a very interesting uh, character. Uh, he's a nuclear physicist. He worked for Euratom, uh, the European Atomic uh, Ag Agency. Um, he's famous for being the founding father of the idea of hydrogen economy. Perhaps you know Jeremy Rifkin? Have you heard of him? He's one of, I mean, Jeremy Rifkin is a promoter of hydrogen as the solution for all sorts of problems, uh, especially clim climate problems, of course. And, uh, but in fact, this is really the, the, the source of inspiration for, for Jeremy Rifkin. Cesare Malchetti, as, um, I mean, he clearly understood that nuclear energy would remain marginal if it is uh, confined to the electricity market. If you want atomic energy to become a really important source of energy, you need to have liquid fuel produced from nuclear energy. 
to, to, to enter in competition with oil. And to do that, you have to mass produce hydrogen. So for him, the solution for the future is to build uh, massive atomic plants in the middle of the oceans, like that people won't, wouldn't complain about being neighbors of an atomic plant. And these atomic plants would mass produce hydrogen and the hydrogen would be exported uh, all across the world. Okay? Um, but this is the kind of uh, Folamour I mean, uh, aspect of the, of, of the guy. But there is another aspect which is very interesting. It is that Cesare Macchetti is interested in, is interested in the time that such uh, a vision could take to become reality. And in 1974, he's hired by uh, a think tank, an inter international think tank called YASA, International Institute for Applied System Analysis, which is uh, a research institute uh, near uh, Vienna in Austria, uh, where there is a group which has been set up. It's, a, it's an international organization. Okay? There are also people from the East and people from the West. You've got people from USSR and people from all sorts of capitalist countries. And there is a group working on the future of energy. And he works uh, for, for this group. And uh, it is at the Yaza that he starts collecting data on the evolution of energy system. And he, he plots these uh, graphs, which, uh, I mean, wh what is original is that he's using a substitution model for energy. And it is really the key to understand the success of this idea of transition. You know the logistic curve? The S curve, right? The S curve um, is very good at describing the diffusion of technologies. If you take mobile phone, the diffusion of, um, of mobile phones in, in a country, they fo this I mean, follows an S curve. And it works for all sorts of different technologies. At the beginning, actually, it was a model for demographers and for biologists. The S curve was uh, discovered or rediscovered by Raymond Pearl, an American biologist who showed that the, uh, the number of flies in a bottle f follows an S-curve. So a slow increase, an inflection point, and then the, uh, the growth is decreasing, and then you've got a limit. Okay? So you all have this curve in mind. The new thing that uh, Cesare Marchetti is doing is that he uses this diffusion model for uh, forecasting the diffusion of energy technologies. And the problem is that diffusion model are, is based, I mean, it works quite well for technologies, but it doesn't work very well for energies. Just as I explained uh, to you before, energies do not, are not necessarily in competition. Okay? Whereas this curve works very well when you've got a competition between two kinds of technologies. I don't know, sailboats and motorboats, for instance. You've got a very nice S-curve. Uh, uh, phone boots and mobile phone. You've got a beautiful S-curve where phone boots completely disappear. Okay? But it doesn't work very well for energy. But he, he feels that it doesn't work very well, but he says, okay, never mind, going to see if it works. And he says that he's amazed by the very good fit between the S-curve and the empirical da data. And, I mean, the logistic curve is a very, it, it is, I mean, it has fascinated uh, thousands of different scientists in different uh, uh, domains because it is a very strong predictive tool. You just need a few points on this curve to uh, define the, the equation of the curve, and then you can project and extrapolate what is going to happen in the future. The S curve is very much used uh, after World War II to forecast the, um, the performance of, of the future performance of, mil of military technologies. The speed of airplanes, the power of engines, the weight of satellites. I mean, the, in the, in the, for, for this kind of, uh, of um, forecasting exercise, you very often you see S curve uh, used. So, what Cesare Marchetti is saying is that history is really a very good tool 
to envision, to forecast the future of an energy. The whole destiny of an energy source seems to be completely predetermined in, in the first childhood. These trends, the S trend, S curve, go unscathed through wars, wide oscillation in energy prices and depressions. So what he's saying is that the global energy system, because of course the interest of this work it is that it is made on a global scale, uh, the global energy system is kind of free from history. It, is a, it has a kind of natural tendency of uh, transitioning between, from one source of energy to a new source of energy. So for instance, you've got coal, which uh, is increasing in, I mean, this is the share of energy, of course, the, the share of energy on the, on the global energy mix. It becomes very important in the 1900s, and then its importance in de is decreasing because of oil uh, and then natural gas. And it is really this work that Jimmy Carter, uh, in a way, is explaining in front of the US television. Probably doesn't know that it comes from Cesare Malchetti. It's uh, one of his advisors who, uh, who has plagiarized the work of Cesare Malchetti in the, in the na US National Energy Plan. But it is really uh, this kind of forecasting which, in a way, justified the idea of energy transition. Okay. What I mean, the, this model of energy transition is extremely uh, useful for when the climate issue starts to appear. In the late 1970s, you've got dozens and dozens of reports on the future of energy. The main topic is the energy crisis, the lack, the scarcity of oil. This is really what is, pro, uh, I mean, preoccupying all the, all the experts uh, at that time. But climate is always present in, in those reports. You always have a chapter on climate change. Um, it is not central, but it is present. And the strange thing is that in all these reports, the idea of energy transition is naturalized. The assumption is that it takes 50 years to have an energy transition. And they refer to Cesare Malchetti, whereas Cesare Malchetti was extremely skeptical on the capacity of, for the global energy mix to have an energy, an energy transition out of fossil fuels in 50 years. I mean, his work was actually uh, built against what was being done at Tiaza. Uh, at Tiaza at that time, the, the modeling of the uh, mo the, the modeling of the future of energy was based on the same kind of methods as the Club of Rome. You would use computers, different uh, uh, numerical models where you feed uh, parameters in the model and you've got different scenarios. And Cesare Marchetti is very critical of this way of doing forecasting. For him, this gives the illusion uh, that the global energy system is Man that you can manage the global energy system. That there are different scenarios. For him, there's just one scenario. There are not several scenarios. And it is uh, the only way of doing proper forecast is with history and the logistic curve. Nevertheless, and for him, the, I mean, the important uh, energy in the future is not nuclear. It's kind of disappointed, actually. It's going to be natural gas. And in this respect, he was quite right. I mean, natural gas uh, did become very important after in the 1980s, 1990s. This idea of energy transition is taken up very quickly by the petroleum industry. And I will stop probably on this, uh, on this slide. Um, Edward David. Edward David is the boss of uh, Exxon, the research and development uh, department of Exxon. He's a, an important scientist and uh, an important engineer. He was a uh, scientific advisor of Nixon. He was head of the um, Bell Labs, the famous Bell Labs, where the electronic revolution took place in the 50s. So he is really an important character. And in 1982, he's invited by James Hansen, who is a climatologist, who be, will become in the 90s one of the heroes of the, uh, of the of the climate issue and the, uh, uh, the uh, of the um, sorry of lanceur d'alerte. I'm I'm I'm, I'm tired. Whistleblower. Sorry, whistleblower about uh, the climate change issue. Uh, 
and he's invited to give a talk at a, at a conference on climatology, and it's quite interesting what he's saying. He starts by saying there is a problem about CO2. I mean, climate change is real. Uh, the greenhouse effect is real. He's not denying climate change, right? He's not a climatoskeptic yet. In the 90s, he will become climatoskeptic, but at that time, he's not climatoskeptic. Well, he's, he's also talking in front of climatologists, so he can't really uh, deny the, the science. But uh, he goes on, the real issue is different. I mean, the greenhouse effect is old science, not very interesting in a way. It's late 19th century science, right? But the real interesting issue is what will happen first, the climate disaster or the energy transition? And for him, both are quite natural, you know? Few people doubt that the world has entered an energy transition away from dependence upon fossil fuel and towards some mix of renewable resources that will not pose the problem of CO2, okay? And he, he, he goes on uh, saying that uh, at the Yaza, they have shown that there are paths that uh, in 50 years uh, can bring an energy transition, okay? And James Hansen, is really, I mean, he, he, you know, he, he buys this story. He publishes this, uh, his talk in the first place of the, of the, of the book uh, coming out of the, of the conference, and he thanks uh, Edward David for his interesting thoughts. Whereas this is a plainly and clearly wrong history, I mean, uh, and, 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 and wrong anticipation. Does it mean that Edward David was honest when he was saying this? Probably not. He knew very well that energy transition was not taking place at that time uh, in the US and of course not in the world uh, for different reasons. First of all, at a, different, uh, at a conference which takes place a few months later in China, uh, in Beijing, he explained that coal will be the main energy in the 21st century. So he knows very well that coal is going to become very important uh, uh, after 1980 and because of the uh, increasing price of oil. Um, and furthermore, one year earlier in 1981, there had been a workshop set up by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And it, I mean, you got all the verbatim in the, uh, which, I, which have been conserved. It's extremely interesting. It's a workshop on climate change. And in this workshop, there is uh, a guy called Shaw, who is working under Edward David on, on the climate issue, and he participates in this workshop. At one point in the workshop, the question of uh, thin fuels or the liquefaction of coal, the transformation of coal into, into liquid fuels um, is discussed. And Shaw is explaining that you will need thin fuels. The climatologists are horrified because they know that in coal there is so much carbon that well, you can reach incredible uh, amount of ppm in the atmosphere if you start using massively coal. I mean, you can reach 1,000 ppm if you burn up uh, the, 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 the coal reserve. So, I mean, it, they're really horrified by this idea. And, uh, and um, Shaw says that, well, you, I mean, you will need uh, these technologies during the transition period. Okay. And at that moment, uh, a guy called Dave, David Rose, who is uh, an, an engineer, nuclear engineer from the MIT, explained how wrong this idea of transition is, that it, doesn't, it will never work. He's also very critical of William Nordhaus. You've heard of William Nordhaus, a famous economist. He got the Nobel Prize uh, for, for, economy, for his work on, uh, on the issue of climate change. What is quite interesting that is not well known, is Nordhaus is working with Cesare Marchetti. And it is Cesare Marchetti who teaches him the basic on climate change. And um, the, the solution promoted by Yaza is actually uh, not doing much for the next 10 or 20 years. And coal is going to be necessary in the next 10 or 20 years. And then in 10 or 20 years, nuclear industry will be ready. To, to, to really uh, make a real transition out of fossil fuels. But for the moment, it's not really possible to, to reduce the consumption of coal or oil. Um, 
uh, not, William Nordhaus is just justifying this uh, kind of procrastinating policy with economic tools, with cost-benefit analysis, but it is just, just justifying the Yaza strategy, which is really a kind of handoff approach. approach okay? So David Rose is very critical of this idea of transition and of William Nordhaus' uh, work. And what he says is quite interesting. Um, basically, the later you start the transition, the faster it has to go if you don't want to overpass a certain threshold, which is 600 ppm. For him, 600 ppm is really the limit that uh, humanity should not reach. But the later you start, the, I mean, the shorter the transition uh, must be, which means that you need an incredible productive capacity, productivity base, production base, sorry, uh, in, in solar panels or nuclear plants, whatever, to replace all the fossil fuels in just two decades. If you start in 2010, according to David Rose, uh, the transition must be finished in 20 years. But then his argument goes, I mean, how come that uh, people will accept to invest uh, in new uh, plants to produce, I don't know, uh, nuclear plants or solar panels or windmills if 20 years later the transition is done and you, you don't need this production capacity anymore? He calculated that if you start the transition in 2010, the US would need the equivalent of 50 or 60 Westinghouse and General Electric in terms of uh, additional, uh, uh, additional electric plants. Okay? But that, that can't happen. And after, after the, the intervention of, um, of David Rose, the, the discussion in the seminar that I mentioned that uh, uh, the EPA organized becomes much more radical. They understand that capitalism will never be able to manage such a transition. It's not something that is even possible for very simple um, reason of the way investment work, the time that investments want to, uh, the, the return must, it's much longer than 20 years and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, the idea that energy transition is possible, that it takes place in 50 years, become common currency. Even among uh, the whistleblowers and the uh, people that want to say there is a problem with climate change. Very often the climatologists in the late 1970s, early 1980s, they say that um, we don't know yet exactly when it will become really catastrophic. There is clearly a problem, but the, the exact date of the catastrophe is not very clear. How long will the uh, polar ice cap take to melt? Well, to melt down. They don't really know, okay? Sometimes you've got, uh, I remember one article of 1978, an important climatologist who says, climate change will become sensible. You will be able to feel that there is something wrong in the climate in the year 2000. It will have an economic impact in 2020, and it will be a complete catastrophe in 2070. Okay, so this is the kind of schedule for the disaster that is envisioned in, the, in 1978. But then he goes on saying that, well, to, I mean, so we still have time, okay? Because 50 years is basically what it takes to have an energy transition, okay? So I will conclude by saying that this idea of energy transition, which is based on a very deeply rooted and mistaken history of technology, history of energy, has been very important, I think, in the, uh, in, the in the history of the denial about climate change. There are many works on uh, climato-skepticism, how the oil industry uh, manufactured doubts, you know, explaining that, no, we still don't know, it's not sure, there are debates, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of works on that. I don't think it has been so important in our procrastination on the issue of climate change. It might have been important in the US, but in Europe, climate skepticism has never been very important. It has always been 
fringe, uh, fringe uh, scientists were climatoskeptics uh, in France at least in, in many different European countries. What has been, I think, really important is this idea that energy transition has taken place in the past and that it will take place in the, in the future thanks to investment and good technologies. And I will stop here. Um, thank you for your presentation. And uh, following the topic of today's seminar, we will talk about history of energy and material symbiosis. And of course, we will a bit repeat uh, the same issues, but as you know, practice makes perfect. Uh, in the second part of the presentation, we decide to uh, link it a bit with the seminar we had in November, the Physical Economy of France by Nello Magale. I hope I'm not mistaken with the name. <laughs> Uh, and so we will uh, slightly shift from the historical anal analysis to the uh, macroeconomic approaches uh, for transition. Um, so, powering their energy transition uh, as a technology-based pathway towards transformation uh, of the global energy sector. But speaking about energy transition, we want to know if the transition is the right word or not. So industrial revolutions normally are shown um, as a transition from wood to coal, as we heard already today, uh, but um, um, or from organic economy to uh, mineral economy. Uh, but um, somehow all this analysis based on the dynamics of uh, technological process. Um, so. Uh, we already saw this graph today, and here it's a bit more colorful. Uh, but as we understood, we see the dynamics, but it's not the real situation. It's only the um, the growth of the energy consumption, uh, which not include uh, any kind of um, materials which stayed um, after this uh, process. Um, so. Uh, and um, and this historical example actually shows perfectly that uh, the energy transition uh, is more a complex process than just uh, a usual transition. Uh, at instead of clear transition from energy source uh, from one energy source to another we see a symbiosis uh, in the consumption of organic and uh, mineral resources. So, uh, we decide to show you also the other way of um, seeing the um, global consumption. So, the global material, uh, material footprint, which um, uh, which means the total amount of raw materials extracted uh, to meet their consumption demands. Uh, and uh, here you can see the global material footprint and you can see also the curve. Uh, and very similar to the graphic we had before, uh, you see that this curve mostly just grows. Uh, and you can see really uh, I mean, it's hard to see some kind of periods here, but um, on this graph, uh, on the aggregate material consumption of Fra France, which um, starts, uh, which tells us the history from the second part of the century, we can see the uh, domestic material consumption, the lines of domestic material consumptions and material footprint, and we see that they are actually super different. So, um, basically, um, their figure indicates uh, no dematerialization of French capitalism despite the technological improvements uh, and the shift of production towards services. Uh, here, also in this graph, you can see a bit better uh, the periods of crisis and their material consumption during this crisis. Um, 
So nowadays, uh, as we know, the industrialization and digitalization process uh, grows, so grows their energy consumption. And uh, as we already know, the increasing of consumption also brings us increasing in all kind of uh, using of raw materials. And um, and, uh, and it's also increasing not only their usage of these materials, but also it's increasing their usage of each material. Uh, so important, so we, so right now we talk about importance of the changing their course towards the green energy. Uh, but we also need to think how we will do that and which instruments, which tool and which resources we plan to use to achieve this goal. Because would it be like real uh, green transition uh, to the energy or would it be just another one process of developing new energy, uh, increasing consumption of energy and so on. Um, so there energy transition from uh, fossil fuels to renewable energy uh, right now is in progress. But uh, achieving the transition to long, uh, to long uh, life energy infrastructure depends also on the rethinking of their current approaches. And uh, of course, this rethinking may slow down the process of their um, green energy transition, but at the same time, we will benefit from the well-designed policy that rewards uh, resources, uh, efficiency and sustainability. And right now I give the word to Federico and he will. Okay. Just let's leave it, okay. So we saw from the presentation of Professor Jean Baptiste the importance of seeing the real consumption of the raw materials for the energy. Then we link this with the, not only the consumption of raw material for energy, but in general, raw, raw consumptions of the economy, uh, presented by the paper uh, of Magares. I, I always have problem with this, with the other seminar, which is the real flows, mat materi real material flows in the extraction and between countries. And then uh, we're going to try to have a, a backwards and go to thinking macroeconomics, like to bring up the economic field that this is like the expertise we have, link it with this topic, and then come back to a kind of conclusion uh, for the economical transition in economic terms. So we have economic, uh, economics for transition. Let's go. Yeah. So we just, we just saw in this presentation and the other seminar that we need to understand what is produced, not only a, a monetary term, but what is produced, how is produced, so this is the aggregation of the consumption, and where is produced, because we, we saw in the last seminar, for example, that the, the raw extraction came from one country to another. So this is the production part we need to understand, what, how, and where, and then on the demand side, we need to understand who consumes, who consumes it. And here we go to the title of, of, the, of France as a parasite. So who consumes and uh, where is it consumed? So we need, a, we need a macroeconomic that help us to understand these issues. Not just a monetary flow, but the real material flows. And what do we produce, how, where, and where does it go and who consumes it? And, the, I already said this conclusion, including the real material flows and consumption is the only way to have a macroeconomic framework in which the two most important issues that we have right now, which is environmental transition and inequalities, can be satisfied. If we do not include or if we do not see the real material flows and the real extraction and the real consumption, we will never have a macroeconomic tool to solve these two problems. So, let's go. I'm going to go through the like, macroeconomic aggregate approaches uh, in the faculty we study. So we have the neoclassical approach, which are usually two. A production function, which most commonly you can see it, for example, in the model of solo, which you have Y, which is total production, depends on capital and labor. 
doesn't tell us anything. It's a production site only. It's only monetary terms. And then it doesn't include what is produced, how is it produced. It just includes capital. And then no one knows what capital is. Actually, there's today neoclassical theory has not been able to solve what capital is. Then the second neoclassical approach is the general equilibrium model based on wall Russian, which is much more interesting because it does include um, real materials in the, in, the, in the equation, but however, it works in a wall Russian imaginary economy that will never happen and still believes in equilibrium. So these two approaches do not help us. Then we have the Keynesian approach, which we all know this formula. The neoclassical approach is a an, an supply side approach. The Keynesian approach, as we all know, is a demand side approach. So in both, we are missing one link because the economy is both links at the same time. And we also have the problem that in Keynesian approach, the flows are monetary flows. And we don't know what do we produce and how do we produce it. And we also have to take into account that this is not even a real function production or a demand production, if you will. Because in most of the time, it is actually an accountable identity, a national accountable identity. So again, it does not help us for the macroeconomic of the future. Then we have the input-output approaches, which is a really general category. You can, you, can, you can start it with Marx. Even if you can go a little bit behind, you can find them in the maybe in, in, in the diagrams, in the flow diagrams of Quest 9. But let, let's say Marx was the first one, then definitely was Rafa with the, the set of equations of the economy. And then recently post Keynesian have took it in the input-output approach, and you might think also in the stock flow, stock flow consistent models, an idea of looking what actually is happening, it's there, even if in the stock flow consistent models you still only treat uh, monetary flows. So, in the input-output approach, what you, you have is matrices of the economy, of how is it produced, where is the result, where is produced, and you can actually trace, if, you, if we had a global input-output analysis, you could actually trace each thing, where, how is produced, and this will be, so that like, it's obviously where I'm going, is that if we want to really think these problems in a coherent way, we have to start thinking a macroeconomics that only focus in input-output analysis. Because this, let us, next slide. This allows us, like this is kind of a conclusion. I'm gonna go in this again. Uh, this is kind of a conclusion because it's the only way we can understand what is produced, how it's produced, and where it goes, and who consumes it. And this is the only way, two things, this is the only possible way where environmental and inequality issues could be coherently treated, first. And second, is the only possible way I see that these new, these new theories of economy theories, which I really doubt they're economy theorists, can be implemented in a coherent way in a macroeconomic uh, framework. And I'm talking especially about circular economy, degrowth or post-growth, and economy of the commons. Why? Because when you say, for example, circular economy, and it's a really nice discourse, I really um, support it, but how do you integrate circular economy to a post um, the aggregate demand equation? It's impossible. You might include it in an input-output, but you cannot include it in an aggregate demand. How do you include degrowth or post-growth in these theories? And here, something important I just want to, like, I think it's an important comment. If, you foc if we focus in degrowth, this is one of the first seminars we had, we're still thinking on production. We can have a really nice degrowth in an economy that doesn't provide education or health and only sneakers. And we will, we will reach our, our goal. The input-output analysis will help us to understand what do we need to produce and forget about growth as a question, as an as a almost epistemological question, and just to produce what we need. So is the kind of macroeconomic that would allow things a circular economy or post-growth or economy of the commons to 
be included in a coherent macroeconomical model, and then from a coherent macroeconomical model to be included in public policies. Next. Okay, this is the questions. I just this is where we had closed the the presentation as we had thought it, but with the professor um, talk, it came uh, another idea. I just want to pump it out. It's really short, and it's the the import uh, the importance of the discourses, and like an invitation to challenge all discourses, even if are the ones we think are correct and the ones we are, because like who had imagine that this course of energy transition uh, involves so many things that will not actually allow us to make an energy transition. So an like, invitation to always challenge all these courses, not as, a, not, as a, not as a to destroy any discourse, but to see that discourse, who made it, why, and does that discourse help us for the new challenges? And that's what I wanted to say. So the two questions for Professor. Um, so the first one, as we have mentioned many times today, energy transition did not consider at all the cumulative and symbio symbiotic nature uh, of the energy and material past. Instead, it allowed us to imagine a uh, decarbonized economy uh, was the um, continuation or, or the culmination of what we have. Can we use the same rhetoric uh, for the notion of digital transition and Industry 4.0. Do they project uh, a present that does not exist onto a future that uh, remains hypothetical? And the second, and the second question, uh, what are the most urgent measures to be implemented from a public policy perspective for an energy transition that do not involve energy material uh, accumulation? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not, not sure I'm able to answer, especially this, uh, this last question. Uh, no, I was really interested in the, the, the idea of um, the matrix analysis. I'm, I mean, I, I've, I'm very bad at economics, but from the lecture I had when I was young, I remember uh, Vasily Leontiev the matrix representation of an economy between different sectors and the input-output tables. And I'm really surprised that you don't, I mean, I, perhaps I'm ignorant and uh, I'd like to have an answer from economists, uh, the economists in the room. Um, do we have this methodology of input-output analysis seriously applied on the idea of decarbonizing the economy? Do, have you ever read a paper on that? Yes? Yes? yes. Would you, I mean, I would be really interested to read it. I, I can search references, but I can get at some. Okay, because I looked it up a little bit, but I'm not an economist, so perhaps I didn't look in the right journal. But in a way, if you do that, you understand that it's an enormous problem, okay? I mean, you could actually have a feeling of that when recently there was a, a, a hike in the price of gas. I don't know if you, of course, you know about that. And for instance, in, in Britain, the, um, the slaughterhouse had to close. Strange, okay. Did you know that? Can you repeat, sorry? The slaughtering house, the slaughter, you can't hear now? Just like some comes Okay. <laughs> Uh, because of the increase in the price of uh, gas, the slaughtering house had to close in Britain for a certain period of time. Certain slaughtering house, I don't know if it's all slaughtering house. Why? Because with gas you produce fertilizers. One of the residue of the production of fertilizers is CO2, which is very useful for conserving meat in packaging. When you talk about decarbonizing the economy, actually you talk about stopping cement production. Okay, what happens in all sorts of sectors? Uh, still making, I mean, does not exist without emission of coal, without the emission of CO2 and the use of coal, actually. So, I mean, if you, if you really look at, I mean, if you, that, that's why, why I would be interested to have a serious work by economists using input-output table to explain us what does it look like an economy which does not emit CO2, okay? Uh, 
so that, that would be my question to you, actually. And since you know, because of course you mentioned the, the post uh input-output economics, which I don't know anything about, but I would be interested to, to, to have some uh, bibliography on this, on this topic. So about your questions now. Um, what do you want me to say? I mean, of course, digital transition, I mean, this is complete rubbish, right? I mean, it's uh, just an addition of a uh, technological layer on a, on a technological basis which remains unchanged. Or, and of course, even the old economy is increasing because of the new economy most of the time, okay? I don't know if you take the production of cardboard, it has increased thanks to Amazon, right? I mean, it's, it's kind, of, kind of obvious, but you know, cardboard production is an old trade. I mean, it dates back from craft, uh, it's late 19th century uh, technology, and, and paper production is even a, a bit uh, more uh, antique. So, I mean, it, of course, the digital transition is, uh, is uh, well, I mean, I think all this is based on the, on the wrong vision of what innovation is, and it must, in the end, for economists, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, bigger story for historians, but for economists, I guess Schumpeter would be the, the guy to blame. This idea of uh, creative destruction that the new replaced the old, and then you've got, of course, disruptive technologies, uh, which has uh, been so, uh, uh, so fashionable uh, since the 1990s. Uh, but this is just wrong. I mean, the, the history of technology doesn't work like this, okay? All technologies do not replace new technologies. In a very basic way, in my closet, I both have a vacuum cleaner and a, a sweeper, broom, a broom. I got both, of course. Uh, but this is true for all sorts of technologies. Okay. Uh, recently, I, um, I was doing archival research in a wheelbarrow manufacturer in, uh, in France, in eastern France. They are producing 600,000 wheelbarrows a year, which means that Human labor is still very, very important in the construction sector, and the constru construction sector in many different countries is the largest economic sector. It's far uh, more important than computers or automobiles. Okay? Uh, if you take the Piketty's figure, you see that um, houses is the biggest part of capital in many different countries, especially in European countries. So this is a crucial sector where human labor is very important. So wheelbarrow is a very contemporary technology in a way. And more interestingly enough, in this uh, factory, they had um, a deep drawing press. I don't know if you know what it is. Uh, it is a kind of huge hydraulic press. You got a sheet of metal and it presses like this and you got a nice shape for the wheelbarrow. The, this machine uh, was a German machine from the 1930s. It's in a perfect good working condition. So the, 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 the production infrastructure is much older than the, um, the, cons the, con the, the, the consumer goods. I mean, this is fairly recent, but the, probably many machines that allow the metal to be uh, is, uh, to, uh, in this, machine, in this uh, telephone is quite old, okay? So, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, I think, uh, uh, especially for economists, it's important to have uh, an idea of the evolution of technology which is not based on the reading of economists. <laughs> and for uh, the most urgent measures to be implemented from a public policy perspective, and well, I mean, well, first of all, stop talking about energy transition, but talking about decarbonization, which is far clearer and much more concrete, and then it starts to be really, really difficult and tricky. Uh, to have very limited goals, goals that you can achieve. You know, when, when there was this report by the IPCC saying that we're going, it's possible to decarbonize the economy, I mean, to not reach 1.5 degree, you know, the 1.5 report, uh, you have to decarbonize the economy in 20 or 30 years. You, I mean, it will not happen, right? I mean, we know that it's not going to happen. So I don't see the point of talking about this goal. So let's have a very clear goal. For instance, one thing that could happen is to get rid of coal to produce electricity. I mean, there are technologies to produce electricity. It's not like, you know, producing cement or steel without coal is going to be difficult, but producing electricity without coal is possible. And do whatever it takes to get out of coal in every country, not just the rich countries, but also the poor and developing countries. That would be, I think, something that should be discussed seriously at an international level with uh, transfer of uh, funds uh, across uh, countries. I mean, that would be a very 
to be a great achievement already. I mean, if we could do that in 20 years, that would be a fantastic achievement, right? Uh, Germany plans to get rid of coal in 2038. You know, even Germany, one of the richest countries in the world, uh, it will take at least 20 years to, 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 to get rid of coal. So if we could accelerate this uh, across the world, that would be uh, the first thing to do. And then they are, they are changing our behavior, but this is kind of obvious and I'm not going to, uh, of course, uh, I mean, I'm not going to gloze on this.